The following message was preached at Gospel City Church, a church that seeks to cast a gospel net for the people of Kuala Lumpur. Good morning, Gospel City Church. Uh, I hope everyone is doing well. Many have returned, having traveled many thousands of miles in the last two weeks. Okay, so how many of you still watch television? Hardly. Yeah, a few. <laughs> I grew up watching television. I, uh, for those of us who are old enough, television meant something, right? Now, <laughs> now it's your device seems to be the one that draws your attention, no longer the big screen. It's just a, it's, it functions more as a screen. So, good morning everyone. My name is Manhon. The reason I talk about television will be obvious shortly. Uh, one of the elders at Gospel City Church. I welcome those of you who are here only for the first time. Um, uh, so we are doing a whole series on Romans. Uh, we, as Rachel read today, uh, we're going to jump into Romans chapter 2. So going back to television, one of my favorite type of TV shows is courtroom dramas. L.A. Law, anybody remember that? Oh, enough? Yeah. Suits. This is more recent, the younger ones. See, I'm old and young at the same time. Yeah. <laughs> Ali McBeal, the more feminine one. Fe- I mean, not feminine, not, but uh, uh, what do you call that? Uh, uh, well, never mind. Ali McBeal. <laughs> Perry Mason, the older one. Right? And uh, the practice. And uh, David shared with me that he almost chose to be a lawyer watching the practice. If every parent can have their kids become lawyers by sent, letting them watch television. That would be a great formula, isn't it? Don't have to study, just watch. But he didn't. That, that formula doesn't work. Huh? <laughs> All right. I love watching uh, shows like this because they mix high-stakes tension, interesting characters, and tough choices into really exciting and engaging storylines. Right? The intense court scenes, and the character relationships keep me hooked. The sharp dialogue and satisfying resolution, often satisfying resolution, with the underdogs winning, make for engaging and entertaining stories that hold my attention, at least. May do likewise for you, too. So I even dreamed of being a lawyer, watching television. Just, I I wish I was like that a defense counsel for the underdog. There are a handful of lawyers in this room, so I will stretch uh, the liberty of trying to speak like a lawyer, as though I understand the the profession. Uh, Bear with me if I make mistakes. Some of you may share the same dream, even though you're not a lawyer. You may, ah, I wish I could be a lawyer. And as we go through the passage this morning, I hope, I'm going to uncover something for all of us and for us to really see that there's actually a lawyer acting as a defense counsel living inside each one of us. So that's the prompter. I hold it there. There's a lawyer living in each of you acting as your defense counsel, every one of us, whether we are conscious about it or not. So let's uh, quickly review what we have covered so far in Romans. So in Romans chapter 1, Paul declares that the gospel is for everyone. He feels an obligation to share it with all people, and he is not ashamed of it. The gospel is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. Now last week, Andy took us through the the toughest part of Romans 1. In Romans 1, verse 18 to 32, he shared about the wrath of God on unrighteousness and concluded with an encouraging truth. If you follow our social media, the quote has been put out last week, that God's wrath targets unrighteousness, but his mercy revealed in the gospel offers forgiveness for sins through Jesus. So our passage this morning is Romans 2, verse 1 to 11, is the follow-on from what Andy read. So the words judged and judging appear seven times in the first five verses of the passage. 
emphasizing the theme of judgment. Judging others is something people often do without even thinking. It's like breathing and blinking in voluntary action. Our minds automatically assess others' actions, deciding if they are good or bad. And this has been the survival instinct that helped humans recognize dangers and know who to trust and who to avoid. However, this type of judging in our passage today points to different motivations. It's not for survival. This tendency to judge others is part of our fallen nature. Having said that, I'm going to push you to do your best in your fallen nature. Since we all have so much experience judging others, let me ask you to do one thing this morning. Those of you with your journal, you have a pen, uh, you can write your answers down. So the question I'm going to pose to you is this. In your personal judgment, think about this now. Close your eyes, reflect. In your personal judgment, who is the greatest sinner you know? Think of that face and his name. Write it down in your journal. We will keep the answer to yourself. I don't need the answer now. So let's move on from there. Yeah. So we examine man's judgment today, this morning, and compare them to God's perfect judgment. As we go through the verses in Romans 2, the first 11 verses, I want to present two main ideas for us to consider. First, the hypocrisy of human judgment. And the second idea is the severity and impartiality of God's judgment. Let's see how this passage challenges our perspective and draws us closer to the truth of the gospel. Let me get our hearts ready. Let's pray. Dear God, we come before you this morning with hearts open to your wisdom and guidance. We thank you for the privilege of gathering together as a community to learn and grow in your word. We ask for your Holy Spirit to be present among us, helping our minds to understand and softening our hearts to respond. In Jesus' name, amen. So our first point this morning is the hypocrisy of human judgment. In his letter, Paul delivered a stern message, which Andy covered last week. Anticipating the reactions of some readers, Paul knew that they might not in agreement, thinking, yes, Paul, you're absolutely right. There are so many sinful people out there. Assuming Paul's word apply to others and not themselves. To counter this, Paul follows his detailed account of human sinfulness in chapter 1 with a warning. Therefore, you have no excuse. O man, every one of you who judges, for in passing judgment on another, you condemn yourself because you, the judge, practice the very same things. With this, Paul points out that our judgment of others are hypocritical as we often overlook our own failings. And in verse 2, Paul asserts that we know that the judgment of God rightly falls on those who practice such things. So God's judgment rightly falls on the right person, unlike our flawed and biased judgments. He sees everything as it truly is, free from personal bias or self-righteousness, while human judgments are often hypocritical and distorted. God's judgment is always accurate and just, falling rightly upon those who practice the very sins they condemn in others. In verse 3, Paul confronts our false sense of security 
Do you suppose so, man? You who judge those who practice such things and yet do them yourself, that you will escape the judgment of God? Paul questions the notion that we can evade God's judgment while committing the same sins we condemn in others. This is a helpful reminder that focusing on the sins of others do not exempt us from God's scrutiny. Finally, in verse 4, Paul points out our disregard of God's kindness and patience. Or do you presume on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? That's in verse 4. So we take God's patience for granted, mistakenly believing it allows our hypocrisy when it should, in fact, lead us to humility and repentance. So I'm going to run through a list of hypocritical, hypocrisy in today's world. I, I, there's a long list, so I just picked four. So for example, not being fully truthful uh, in the full information of your job applications to enhance your qualification and to gain benefits or entry into a particular position. Illegally downloading software, music, games, and videos instead of purchasing them. Claiming credit for ideas that are not our own. Disparaging our competitors to advance our careers, for those of you who are working. So in each of these scenarios, we readily, as I read them, you readily recognize the wrongdoings when others commit these acts. Yet, often, we rationalize our similar, similar behavior. This is exactly what Paul cautions against. Judging others for these sins will, while committing the same or similar ones ourselves lead us to self-condemnation. It's ironic that when we criticize others for cheating or other wrongs while doing the same things ourselves, we are quick to call out others' mistakes but slow to admit our own. Jesus, in the Gospel of Luke, told a parable about two men who went up to the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee, and the other was a tax collector. This is, if you have your full Bible, not the Romans uh, journal, you can flip to Luke chapter 18, verse 11 to 14. I will read it for us. The Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed thus, God, I thank you that I am not like the other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast saying, God, be merciful to me. A sinner. I tell you, Jesus said, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humble, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. What the Pharisees did may be something you very quickly, involuntarily do also. So, but why do we judge others so quickly? It is often, my argument is this, it's often a way to avoid facing our own sins. When I call another person proud, I don't need to evaluate myself on my pride. He is proud. So attention is focused on them, not me. When I call a brother shallow, I point attention on him and I exempt myself from that yardstick. These are dangerous and unrighteous ideas. 
And that's what the Pharisees did. It is easier to point out what others are doing wrong than to admit and deal with our own issues. When we see the wrong in others, we show that we know what sin is. So we can't pretend we don't know about our own sins. The tax collector knew where he stood before God. A maybe more practical example. Imagine being 10,000 ringgit in debt. That is overwhelming to some of us, less overwhelming to others, but still you're in debt. Now think about someone who is 10 million US dollars in debt. Their debt is way bigger, but he doesn't change, but that doesn't change the fact that you are still 10,000 ringgit still in debt. So this illustration shows that while some sins might look worse than others, we are all in debt when it comes to sin. Just like owning less, owing less money still means you're in debt, smaller sin, smaller sin still means you're guilty before God. It doesn't matter how big or small the sin is, both leave you owing. Now Paul is saying that we are partial in our judgment. We compare ourselves to others to feel better about our own flaws. We see others... We see, we see people with bigger sins and think we're doing okay. But this comparison is wrong. To God, sin is sin. And we all need His mercy and forgiveness. Whether it's the obvious sins Paul first talked about in chapter 1 or the hidden internal ones, we all fall short of God's standard. God be merciful to me, a sinner. The tax collector did not compare himself with the Pharisee. He knew where he stood as a sinner. So as we go through, uh, carry on in the whole Roman series, you will see that Paul gets to the good news in the last verse of chapter 3. He spends the first three chapters talking almost, almost entirely about sin. So last week, chapter 1 was sin. This week, again, sin. Next week, and the week after, and another week, we will still be focusing on the idea and understanding of sin. You might wonder why does Paul spend so much time on sin? Why does he go into such detail when he could have just explained it quickly? The reason we need three chapters to understand how serious our sin is, as Andy put it last week, you won't appreciate how good the good news is until you understand how bad the bad news really is. We're great at making excuses and justifying our actions. Almost, there's almost no limit to how much we can rationalize our sins. Some of you might be doing that even now. It sounds like Manhon is describing something I have done. But he isn't really talking about me because the situation I was in, the one I'm commenting about, is different. The circumstances was different. So he's not really pointing me out. We have this heart, as I said earlier, that acts like a lawyer defending ourselves. Shh. You can hear the articulation of the arguments in your mind. Think about what defense counsel do. For those of you who are lawyers, their job is to defend their client no matter what. They're not trying to be fair and balanced. They are engaged as a counsel for their client. They do their best to defend the client. The decision to be fair and balanced is the judge's job, not the counsel's job. Right? So a lawyer gathers all the evidence and witnesses they can get so they can get their client out of trouble. Their goal is to make their client look good even if they think their client is, even if they think their client is guilty. They will 
they're still trying to cast doubt on the crime or at least minimize the client's responsibility. That's what we have inside us. A heart that acts like your own defense counsel. The inner lawyer in each of us is so masterful with his advocacy that we, the guilty party, fail, fall mesmerized by his persuasion that we believe we are not guilty. The lawyer in us constantly leads us to believe that our sins either do not exist or aren't really that bad. Instead of judging others, we should focus our, on our own need for repentance and seek God's grace to change our lives. By acknowledging our own debt of sin, we can better grasp the greatness of God's forgiveness and extend that same grace and understanding to others. That covers the first point that in the first four verses. Now let's move to our second idea this morning and look at the characteristics of God's judgment. The, six verse, uh, the seven verses from 5 to 11. In Romans 2 verse 5, Paul warns, but because of your heart and impenitent heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath when the God's righteous judgment will be revealed. So a stubborn heart that refuses to repent only accumulates more of God's wrath. As Andy explained last week, the wrath, wrath is the result of sin when men willfully exchange God's truth for lies. Those of you who took notes, you will have these notes in your, in your journal. This verse is a reminder that our refusal to admit and turn from sin has eternal consequences. Paul reinforces this in verse 6, quoting from Psalm 62, verse 12, He will render to each one according to his works. God's judgment is just and righteous and will be based on our action. Our persistent sin and lack of repentance will be met with his wrath. Paul contrasts the outcomes of those who seek righteousness versus those who persist in unrighteousness. In verse 7, he states, To those who by patience in well-doing seek for glory and honor and, immort and immortality, he will give eternal life. Those who seek to live righteously, even amidst their imperfection, will receive eternal life to God's, through God's grace. And then in verse 8, he warns, But for those who, self, who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, there will be wrath and fury. So self-seeking behaviors and disobedience to God's truth lead to wrath and fury. And finally, the last three verses, 9, 10, and 11. Let me read it before I go into the, the uh, presentation of it. In verse 9, There will be tri tribulation and distress for every human being who does evil, the Jew first and also the Greek, but glory and honor and peace for everyone who does good, the Jew first and also the Greek, for God shows no impartiality. Sorry, for God shows no partiality. Slip of my tongue. Don't judge me, please. <laughs> uh, God's justice is clearly here, absolute, right? Nobody circumvents it. Nobody gets a free pass. Notice the phrases. Each one in verse 6, every human being in verse 9, and everyone in verse 10. There is not a human being in the face of this earth who won't get the justice they deserve. We face a God who is just, righteous, and absolute. How do you think you will stand against such a judge? I will quote from Andy last week. We are likely to be 
dead on arrival, he said. Yeah. God knows. He looks at me. You can't save yourself, Manon. But God does not judge like man and condemn him. You can't save yourself. We are partial, hypocritical, and self-seeking. But God, Paul tells us that God's judgment is impartial. He judges everyone equally based on their action, not their status or heritage. Paul's message shows us that our need for the gospel uh, shows us an, our need for the gospel. Whether we are blatant sinners or hidden hypocrites, we all need God's mercy and forgiveness. The good news is this: mercy and forgiveness is available to us. I bring us to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is a gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. Salvation is a gift of grace. It is not something we earn or deserve. It is given to us freely because, God's, because of God's love and mercy. God looks at Jesus, the sinless and righteous man, and finds us to be sinless and righteous. It is because Jesus is sinless and righteous. In a world where we often, it sort of does not compute, right? Some people find it difficult to understand the wrath of sin and the, the free gift of grace because it just does not compute. Because in a world where we often have to earn everything, whether it's our salary, our income, our reputation, our grades, for those of you still studying, grace stands out in stark contrast. Grace is unearned, undeserved, and freely given. This means that no one can claim special status or privilege before God. Our heritage, our religious background, our deeds, none of this can earn us favor with God. What matters is our relationship with Him through Jesus Christ. On our own, we cannot do anything to warrant being considered righteous. It means that our standing before God isn't based on our performance, but on His grace. It means that no matter how much we have messed up, no matter how far we have strayed, God's grace is available to us. It means that our salvation is secure, not because of what we have done, but because of what Christ has done for us. So if you know this, and you receive this grace, but you continue to judge others, thinking that it will make you look less awful before God? Read today's passage again. Paul talked about the promise of eternal life for those who seek righteousness in verse 7, thinking it, will, it is not about a checklist of good deeds. It's about that, our relationship with God. How can we seek righteousness? The it begins, maybe, consider this, embracing the gift of grace through faith and repentance, knowing that saves you, and therefore you don't have to save yourself by judging others to differentiate yourself from the more sinful one, because all are sinful. Right? So receive that grace, embrace it through faith, and repent. Recognizing that we can't earn our way to God is essential. Coming to Him in humility, acknowledging our sins, trusting in Jesus Christ for our salvation is the foundation. The journey involves a heart change. A shift from self-reliance to dependence on God's grace. So, to help us wrap up the two points, let me recast Paul's message again and propose some applications to deal with our sins and when we see others' sin. Our tendency to judge others often reveals our own guilt and need for repentance. 
God's righteous judgment is impartial based on our actions and His kindness is meant to lead us to repentance. The understanding, this understanding calls us to a sense of humility and a renewed focus on our own needs for God's mercy. But there's an even greater truth that we must hold on to. That's the message of the gospel. At the heart of the gospel is that is the reality that Jesus Christ has already borne the judgment that we deserve. On the cross, Jesus took upon himself the full weight of God's wrath. The wrath that we read of, uh, uh, Andy took us through last week, against sin. Jesus bore that upon himself on the cross. He was judged in our place so that we might receive forgiveness and new life. We will cover this in a few weeks' time, Romans 3, 23 to 24. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by His grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. So we are painting to you how bad the bad news is and leading us with expectation of what the real good news is at the end of chapter 3. Despite our sins and shortcomings, we are justified, declared righteous through Jesus' sacrifice. The justification is not something we earn through our own efforts, but it's a gift of grace. God provides the righteousness that He demands. He provides the righteousness that He demands. As Paul explains in subsequent chapters in this letter uh, to the Romans, you don't have to achieve that righteousness on your own. You can't. But God graciously provides us with a way to freely acquire that righteousness through His Son, Jesus. Now, understanding that Jesus has taken our judgment ought to change everything. It frees us from the burden of trying to earn God's favor and from the fear of judgment, which leads us to judge others. Right? Instead, it, feels, it should fill us with gratitude and love as Vaughn prelude in his prayer and his uh, songs this morning. It should fill us with gratitude and love, compelling us to live in a way that honors him. The inner lawyer in my heart actually should be retired. I don't need to engage him. So as we examine our hearts and recognize our sins, let's turn to God in humility and repentance, knowing that His judgment has been satisfied in Jesus. Let His kindness draw us, us closer to Him and transform our lives. This transformation should be evident in how we live daily. It changes us so that we are that we are readily extend the same grace and understanding to others that which we have received from God. What we receive, we extend to others. So when we notice the sin of others, it should promise to look at ourselves. It will be good practice for each of us to hold a mirror to ourselves Every time we recognize sin in another person, I'm going to give you a list of examples. When we see someone who is arrogant, instead of judging that person, we should ask, are there places in my life where I think I am better than others? When we see someone ignoring the Lord, we should ask, are there areas in my life where God is ignored? When we see someone ripping someone off, we should ask, am I stealing from others in more subtle ways? When we see someone engaging in abusive behavior, we should ask, am I abusive to others with my gossip, criticism, and unkind words? When we know someone is struggling with, some, with drugs or sub, other substance or other form of addiction, should we ask, is there something in my life that has control over me, 
my food, my car, television, sports, does it control me? It may not be drug, but you are still controlled by things. When we suspect someone is being unfaithful to their spouse, we should ask, am I giving my relationship the attention it deserves? Or am I giving my best to others? So remember, the question I posed at the beginning, in your personal judgment, who is the greatest sinner you know? The right answer, brothers and sisters, is that you should always be the biggest sinner you know. We have no place in judging others' sin. And our accountability to God is our self and our relationship with Him. If God had given us what our sins deserve, we'll be sitting in hell right now. God is not obligated to give us even a minute of time to repent of our sins. He would have given, he would have been entirely justified in responding to our sin with immediate judgment. But he didn't. And that's the good news. Not only did he withhold that immediate judgment, he even provided a way for us to be saved through, though it required the death of his own son. This should lead us to repentance. This is what Paul is saying in the verses this, this morning. Should we not devote the rest of our lives marveling at his grace? How could we not? Let me close us with a prayer. Heavenly Father, we acknowledge that if we were to receive what our sins deserve, we would be lost forever. Yet in your boundless mercy and grace, you withheld your immediate judgment and provided a way for our salvation through the sacrifice of your Son, Jesus Christ. Lord, help us to always remember that we are the greatest sinner we know. Let this awareness drive us to a deeper gratitude for your grace and a greater commitment to live in a way that honors you. You have shown us a grace that we can never earn and do not deserve. Strengthen us to live each day in the light of your mercy, devoting ourselves to worship and service, reflecting your love to those around us. May our hearts be transformed moving from self-reliance to total dependence on your grace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for listening to this message. We invite you to learn more about Gospel City Church at gospelcitychurch.my.